nice to meet you. Have a fun show. What's up, guys? We are live uh, behind the scenes a little bit, just trying to get some stuff uh, dialed in. Uh, but again, we're um, live from Italy. Just shout out to London. Uh, he's going to be our guest next week. So you guys get to ask all of those questions you've probably been asking me about what he's doing out there. Why did he move out there? What is what's going on? Um, those are questions for him. So we're going to ask him and, and find out more about that. Today, we have a, a guy that's well known around here. I, you know, I was using the word a little <laughs> bit of a, a legendary here in Denver. Mile High Dave is well known. Um, I've you know, his his aura, his presence in, in the cannabis community and kind of like cultivated synergy and some of the, the well-known spots in Denver that, that used to be around. Uh, this this man's name was was about. Um, and I never knew what you looked like until, what, five minutes ago. Um, and that's something right. that I, I wanted to kind of give you a salute on is because that's that's how it was for a long time. I think a lot of individuals just like to carry themselves, let their artwork speak for it, for itself. That's something that right. I think you're like continuing and carrying on uh, for our right. audience. Some of our, the newer individuals, you know, this guy's on the other side of, of the kitchen cooking, um, you know, using different techniques, uh, obviously using synthetics. So uh, you got your your branded Athena hat on. So I know a lot of individuals are starting to see that brand pop up. Um, and I wanted to reach out to one of the experts in my, you know, that that is running this. Um, and kind of pick your brain. Marco's going to help, you know, kind of just find a bridge and start to understand from your side of things why you're uh, running it this way. Uh, you know, you're obviously hitting home runs with it. You've been in High Times Magazine three times. Uh, so, you know, already. So there's a lot of success that you're finding doing it this way. And before we came live, you know, we were all saying we're all on the same team. I think some of the silliness behind the scenes with cannabis individuals um, if you guys really knew what went on behind the scenes, you yeah, know, you would laugh I, at I was telling my wife that uh, <laughs> synthetics and organic is the equivalent of, is the cannabis version of Ford versus Chevy. It's kind there of you silly. Go. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it's so kind of silly in my opinion. Exactly. There's a lot of, you know, bench racing, you know, you're sitting there just right. talking about it. And the end result, you know, as you can see from your IG, man, I was, I've been following you on my cannabis account for a while. And um, Thank you. man, you can see just from your photos and just from that final product that, you know, hey, we're all growers and there's a way to master, you know, every type of technique that there is to grow. So, man, I'm excited, Absolutely. man. You mentioned when we got on, you're like, well, shoot, I used to grow organic 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, well, damn, I was growing with salts like almost that long ago. So it's almost like a yin and yang type of thing. Right. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Man, it'd be cool to just kind of talk it up as growers, man. And, um, you know pros and cons things you like things you do and it's all kind of all about your system what you got going on um yeah i i can just tell you kind of in in, in a general cert in a general sense the reason why i like uh salts versus organics personally um i feel like i have a little bit more control of the media what's coming in what's going out so um, and, and I mean that in terms of EC and pH, not only that with salts, and I won't just say with any salts, but uh, with particularly clean salts, like the Athena brand, I'm not just, you know, I'm not just a guy that, that, you know, um, likes to hype brands. Uh, I've tried, you know, just about every nutrient on the market, every salt on the market, Athena really is super clean. So when you're dealing with clean salts, you have the ability to drive that EC up a little bit more than, you know, what the average legacy grower would be used to. Like when you talk about growing at three, three and a half EC, some guys are just like, wow, man, like, how do you not burn your plants? Well, it's a different, uh, it's a different, yeah, we're dealing with synthetic nutrients that were created in a laboratory. But then again, you have to look at where are those source ingredients coming from? Are they the best source ingredients you can find? Or are they just throwing anything they can in a bag and slapping a logo on it and trying to hype you into buying it? So I think that with the Athena brand especially, they really take the time to R&D and research their nutrients, their source nutrients. They're only taking stuff from the best places like i know they they only take certain nutrients from like the west coast for instance source ingredients versus like they won't take stuff from the east coast because it's not as pure um stuff like that you know when a nutrient company goes into that much effort to make sure the grower is getting the top quality product 
the best quality product that they can, then that's kind of, you know, a company I lean more towards. So I, you know, after trying a lot of different things, I've achieved the best results with Athena. And I think a lot of that has to do with the work they put into it before it ever hits the market. What is your style you're running? Are you running cocoa? What, what, how are you running? I run a hundred percent cocoa. So currently I, I run four plants of light. I grow in five gallons. I run a hundred percent cocoa. Um, Every once in a while, I run the uh, that Mother Earth 70-30, which I like a lot. But I find 100% cocoa, I'm getting a little bit better results. Um, um, I hand feed daily. I hand mix daily. I won't say hand feed. I have drippers set up, but I hand mix daily. And I think that's a big thing with salts that a lot of people don't do. They tend to mix, mix these huge batch tanks, and they sit there for a couple days. And I find that I get better results when I'm hand mixing daily and feeding, and feeding those plants fresh nutrients every single day. They just do better than if I mix a big tank and it sits there for three, four or five days a week. And, you know, I continually feed off the same container. Um, and again, I'll go back to cleanliness of the nutrients. You know, a lot of salts out there, they have a tendency to clog drippers and they leave a lot of, uh, you know, residue and sediment in your reservoir. I'm not really getting any of that. So those are the things that enable me to really push, you know, the limits of what I can do. So I wanted to kind of dive deeper into like, why is Athena so like it's, it's popping off. You know, like I was going to say, you know, so fantastic or whatever, but I, I've never obviously used it or anything. Trying to understand why more individuals are willing to wear the hats, the shirts. We've talked about marketing and branding uh, several times on the show where that starts to, you know, that that's a canary in the coal mine, if you will. It's like, wow, the, there's a shift in the movement here when people are rocking this kind of well, stuff. Well, they, they obviously have great marketing and branding, you know, Um but I think even beyond that, like I said, the quality of their R&D department and the lengths they're willing to go to to try to make sure something is tried and true and tested before it ever hits the market is really is what's separating them in terms of why growers are getting their product for the first time and seeing the best results ever. Like, oh, my gosh, like this is better than anything I've ever gotten before with anything else I've used. And that's how it was for me. I've used, you know, you name it, dude. I've. Back in the day, man, I used to get worm castings and bat guano and pertolite and vermiculite and mix all my own, hand mix my own, you know, my my own little concoctions. And I I would, you know, try to change things here and there. And I'd, I'd be adding all kinds of stuff. And I've never got the results as I have with a simple three-part nutrients. You know, it's just really simple and, and it, it works. So I, I would say that Above all else, branding and marketing is great, but results speak for themselves. And I think the amount of people showing top quality results with the product, like on Instagram and social media, is what's really driving the company up through the roof right now. You know, it's the quality of results that people are showing like, hey, you know, um, I, one thing I hear a lot from organic growers is, you know, salts, you have no turps. It gets no terps. You have no terps, cardboard terps. I hear that a lot. But then at the same time, I have to look back and say, okay, if you look at Athena, they've won like several major competitions from ZA Olympics to like cannabis cups across the board in the terps category, as well as looks and flavor and everything else. I mean, they're just winning all kinds of awards. So that, and me myself, um, you know, from the results I've gotten, I haven't had any terp issues whatsoever. So I think a lot of times when people are saying things like cardboard terps, that a lot of times that's grower error. That's not even the nutrient company. It's not even the quality of the salts. Like, yeah, Athena is great, but I think you can get great terps with just about any salt out there. Um, as long as you take the time at the end to do it right. And so I think a lot of people are just rushing stuff to market. And hence the cardboard terps, you know, they're in such a rush to, you know, it's, it's a head scratcher for me why anybody would take 
six months to grow something to the best of its quality only to turn around and try to rush dry it in a week just to put it out there and make money, you know? And this is where you're getting a lot of those quote unquote cardboard, cardboard terps from is from guys just rushing things to market, trying to make a buck as quick as they can. And you know, the, the consumer suffers. So do you feel like, you know, pretty much terps would be the same, you know, organic grown to, you know, Athena. So if I was to make that switch, I wouldn't, terps wouldn't be something that I would say, oh, well, I am noticing a little bit less here. I mean, what, what um, I, I think it's possible, but I think the difference is going to be minimal. And I say that because of some of the, you know, the best phenos that I found with the best terp profiles, I've seen guys grow it organically and the terp profile is nearly identical. I mean, I don't really see much of a difference. You might have, it might have a slightly better wasp percentage. Um, you know, there might be minute differences, but nothing to where you're like, Oh, this was grown so much different. Like I can, you know what I mean? Like, um, I don't see any quality difference in organic versus salts. As long as you're taking pride in your craft and you're doing things the right way all the way down to the curing process, which I think is <laughs> as as important, if not more important than the growing process, because so many people flub the curing process, like I said, in an effort to make money yeah. as soon then, as possible. Definitely. Do you, um, obviously, you, do you do any kind of flush where water only for, what's that period of time that you work? So usually I flush, usually my target EC for finished product is be between 0.5 and one. So I tend to flush, I tend to bring it down slowly over the last 14 days. I constantly monitor runoff, uh, pH, EC, and I make minor adjustments to kind of just bring it down slowly to where the last three days it's getting nothing but water. And that usually brings me, you know, within those final target points, like 0.5, 0.7, that's fine with me. And okay. I, I don't have any terp issues at all, you know, no no uh, black ash or anything weird. Okay, so basically you're watering out until that leachate at the end of your run is about half an EC pretty much. Right. That makes sense. See, I think that's another thing where salt growers can have some issues too is guys just run it hard out to the end, you know what I mean? You definitely can't do that. Right. And, and I've known guys that have, well, you know, and there's some, some tests, there's some scientific experiments out there. I can't remember who did it, but uh, I know there was an experiment done where um, they did a blind test and they, and they, they ran stuff at super high EC. They didn't do any flush. And that stuff actually that had no flush got better reviews from the smokers liked it more than the stuff that had been flushed. So I mean, you can take that however you want it. I just know that uh, um, I prefer to flush. Um, it's something I've always done. I don't. I don't believe in running things all the way until the end. Until the end, you know, at top EC, I usually run at about three and a half EC all the way to day fifty, and then day fifty is when I start to bring things down. Over the last fourteen days, I usually don't run anything past sixty-four days. Over the last fourteen days is you know, I just slowly bring that EC down a couple points a day until we're at, you know, where I want to be. So is a lot of your work uh, strictly to flower or are you washing and having that stuff pressed out? And all that? I am having a lot of stuff washed. Um, I tend to test wash everything, but my main thing is pheno hunting. I'm consistently looking for the best that I can find. You know, I'm looking... I'm constantly popping new seeds. Um, when I started this about three years ago, I kind of got back into it and I decided, you know what? I got a state license. I'm going to go ahead and dedicate my life to this. So that's what really is the difference between you've never heard of Mile High Dave a few years ago to you're hearing Mile High Dave all over the place now is because I'm, I'm pushing my brand to that point because that's where I want to be, you know? Um, I decided to put everything I have into this and that's what I do. I dedicate my life to this plant beyond this. The only, it's the most important thing in my life beyond my family. Damn. I got to give you a gold bar. That's deep because the, he's, 
you're putting out that energy. So it's not a, you're, you're not surprised, right? You're not right. surprised they're hearing about no. Mile High Day because that's what I want. So that's key right there, man. Put out what you want and go right. for it. Put the energy. I, I, I'm a firm believer that projection is the step before manifestation. If you don't see it oh. in your mind, it'll never materialize in the physical world. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's that's worth that's worth the whole talk right there. If anybody gets anything, out of it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like such bullshit until you uh, experience it for yourself, and then right. you kind of have that like click on of the third eye or however you want to view it, where you're like, wow, right. the world is right. a little bit different than I was taught. And, uh, exactly. So we're going. I right. mean, I'm just like, I feel like, look, we are. It is what it is. You run a sauce. We run an organics. I want to talk some some strains, you know, because I'm like you, man. I'm okay. always looking for something very terpy, very different, very unique. What kind of stuff are you um, finding right now? What, like, what are you, you know, what's your hard hitting terps? So right I would say one of my most impressive strains right now in terms of terp profile is Dante's Inferno number six. It's a strain put out by Clearwater. And um, initially I bought... I want to say five packs of seeds from them. And my two best keepers all came from the same pack. Hmm. Uh, majority of the this plants that I got from them had no terps. Um, the other majority had like kind of grapeish candy terps, which my number one keeper, Dante 8, does. It has kind of like a grape candy with like a little hint of gasoline on the back end. But it's really like you know, artificial grape, almost like a pack of great big league chew or something. Um, but the number six Fino, it's like its ability to like overwhelm a room is second to none. Like, uh, so I don't know if you ever remember the big packs of Kool-Aid with the sugar in them. So, you know, when you first yep. open like a fruit punch or a cherry, you know, that dust that comes out. Mm -hmm. and how Put your nose really down in there. Bro, that's the <laughs> nose on the Dante six to the tea it's like a artificial sugar candy and like i could i could have an ounce in my kitchen and the smell will fill the entire room and my living room is fairly big so it's it, it's definitely a head turner and every single person i gave it to i went to mj bizcon you know i gave it to the jungle boys i gave it to ivan ivan looked at me and was like man we smoked the fuck out of your shit dog like they loved it you know <laughs> so that right there made me feel good every single person i gave it to was just like what I gave it to Craft Farmer. He said, "What the fuck is this? Oh my God! Look at this!" And like you know, when I get those type of reactions from guys who I've looked up to coming up as a grower, who I've always been like, "Wow! If only I could accomplish like a portion of what they accomplished." If they're looking at my flower, going, "Whoa!" Then I feel like, okay, maybe I'm doing something special here. I'm on the right track. So, you know, um. But yeah, I would say Dante Six was probably the most unique. I would say the other one, um, I have a watermelon Z crossed with tropical Z. Uh, that one is just amazing too. Look wise, it's not as crazy. You know, all the Zs kind of had that outdoorsy look a little bit, more of a sativa look than like the heavy, thick indicas. But man, the flavor profile on it is just incredible. That's another, it's like a, if you took all the gummies, you know, in a store and just shoved them all in your mouth at once, that's the kind of flavor burst you get from it. It's just like incredible. And every single, again, I don't smoke a lot of flour myself. I tend to, I, I'm a concentrate guy. So I tend to give out a lot of flour for feedback. And um, th those two have gotten the best feedback in terms of terp profile and flavor and I, I myself believe that, but you know, I can't just go off of what I think. I I need the feedback from the people, the consumer. Boom, that's key, man. I, and I've been um getting on my concentrates now, and I feel the same way though. I still take that top of uh, uh, the top shelf of my flower, and I like people to have that, and I want them, you know, give me that experience. Tell me what you think. And um, yeah, so that's that's good stuff, man. I've been looking for watermelon. Terps. Who would you say you got that watermelon from? Oh yeah, that watermelon rush definitely hits that that note. If you uh yeah, if you want, I can shoot you a cut, no problem. Oh shit. Okay, we'll get on that later. So who 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 that come from? Was that one that you kind of been working with and creating, or did you? Pick that's that again. That's a uh, so that came from a tester pack. I believe it was from Tiki Madman. Mm. 
And um, yeah, I believe that was a Tiki Madman tester pack. Or no, it was a freebie pack that came with a pack of no. So when I started about three years ago, I spent about twelve thousand dollars and I bought as many seeds from all the quote unquote top breeders in the industry. Bought a bunch of tiki stuff, bought a bunch of seed junkie stuff, a bunch of clear water stuff. I mean, you name it, man. Any breeder you can name a Masonic smoker, I bought them all. In the end, seed junkie. Clearwater, Tiki Gear is what lasted. That's the stuff that I'm still growing now, you know, out of like 500 seeds. And I'm not knocking any of those other breeders. Um, you know, I tend to push things hard, so not every strain is going to respond well to that. You know, not everything likes to get fed at high EC. You know, there's a lot of these genetics out there. You feed them lower, they do a lot better. That's just not what I do. I like to feed stuff at high EC, I like to keep stuff that does well under high EC. And one of the reasons for that is because I tend to sell a lot of clones. So when, you know, I have a genetic that does really well under high EC, the next grower who might not be as proficient as me is less likely to have an issue with that if he overfeeds, which is one of the what that's usually the main issue with in, in anybody's garden is overfeeding. So uh, by by putting out nothing but you know only keepers that I find that feed at really high EC um, eliminates a little bit of that tendency for people to overfeed and get in trouble with cuts. So you know that's just my my philosophy on it. You know, feeding that high EC, you gotta feed them that light too. So are you running? What's your light situation? You gotta be pushing that real hard. And, and do you look at those kind of equally, or how do you run that? Yeah, so I, I run LEDs. I run 100% LEDs. Um, Love them. When I'm pushing DLI, I just tend to push CO2, um, which helps the whole system. So, you know, feeding at high EC, I'm pushing DLI 1200 plus, sometimes between 11, 1200. And then, you know, I'm pushing C CO2 1500 ppms or greater. That's right. That's what people got to understand. Don't just go grab the thing and run 3.2 and try to hit the hit the. I, I've had I've had guys do it. I had a I had a buddy on IG. He's you know we used to do like to do friendly competition. He saw me posting. I was feeding at three and a half EC, and I and then I saw him posting that he was feeding that three and a half EC, and I just shook my head and said, "Boy, you better know what you're doing there." And then sure enough, he messaged me. He was like, "Man, I burned my." <laughs> It's like, yeah, if you're going to feed that high, not only are, should you increase all those other, you know, CO2, DLI, but you should also increase runoff. 20 to 30 percent runoff is really critical when you're feeding at those high numbers, at least for me. Like I said, I grow in five gallons, so I like to push, you know, fresh round of nutrients through daily. Um, I also do. So depending on, on EC, I like to keep my medium EC between like four and a half and like six and a half. And if it starts to push higher than that, then I do what you call a flush day on flush days. Again, it gets, um, I just flush with either anywhere between 0.5 and one EC to bring it down. So, um, let's say I water, I'm going in at three and a half. I check my runoff. It's coming out at seven. Okay. Next day I'm going in at half an EC Maybe for the next two days, I'll go in at half an EC until it comes back down into the range that I want and just keep going from there. And hit them again. Okay. Right. Okay. I want okay. to ask how you, a lot of people don't understand that that's how you grow with salts. Uh, it's a lot different than organic. Uh, you know, I had a buddy say, man, I've never gotten over three a light. Or he's, he's never gotten over one a light. And I said, you've never gotten over one a light. I said, well, what's your runoff numbers? He said, what do you mean? So, you know, you're, you're not, that's a lot. One of the main things a lot of people don't do is check runoff. Now, um, when you feed, do with, you, I'm sorry that? to cut you off just to, just to get your clarification on how you feed and runoff. So now if you're going to feed a three EC, you're going to feed how many gallons? And then when are you going to check, you know, what stage are you checking at runoff, your leachate? So um, I grow in five gallon pots. Let's say I have a room of, 90 plants in five gallon pots. I'm going to run about 100 to 150 gallons through there daily. 
until I achieve that 20 to 30% runoff. There might be days when I might do 100 gallons because I want to achieve a little bit more of a dry back, especially in the first couple of weeks. But as we get into, you know, week three, four, five, six, I'm feeding upwards of 150 gallons a day. Um, I think that translates to about roughly like 1.3 gallons a pot. Um, and that and that's enough to give me the 20 to 30 percent runoff that I'm looking for. Got you. Have you worked done, done anything with kind of um, drought uh, stress at the end, where you're all, not, along with the flush and just kind of slowing the increment of watering? No, I haven't. I've heard. Well, I actually, I can, I take that back. We, I do tend to slow down watering a little bit the last week or so, um, but that's because I'm trying to slow down how fast my EC is dropping. Uh, so for me, it's all about it's all about EC. Whatever the EC is, is how I'm adjusting my watering. If the EC is, you know, high, I'm watering more. If it's low, I'm watering less. So towards the end, I tend to water a little bit less because I I don't want the EC to drop off too fast to where the plants are just eating themselves. You know what I mean? Makes sense. So what are your thoughts? Um... As a salt grower, like back in the days, some of the homies believed that if you didn't have a little bit of a burnt tip, that you weren't pushing her as hard as she needed to be pushed and all that. I, I agree kinda... with that 100%. I, I have, I usually have, uh, if you look at my photos of, uh, you know, my plants, I usually have the slightest tip burn. And that to me tells me they're eating at their maximum potential not to push them anymore. This is why I keep it in that six, five, four, five media runoff range because i found that any higher than that it tends to burn a lot more you know what i mean and so that's the sweet spot for me uh for for my environment i can't say that would be the sweet spot for everybody in their environment it really depends on what type of lights you're running and a few other environmental factors especially yeah. here in denver with the genetics and all that um marco had kind of brought that up i had that on my list of questions to talk to you but uh, on a deeper level here in Denver alone, have you ever heard of Ben Holmes Centennial Seeds? No. Uh, so I, I don't think he's popular anymore or whatever, but th when you were talking watermelon genetics and some of that stuff, that, that gentleman has some of that stuff that I think is so rare, some land race stuff. You had mentioned some of the other genetic uh, breeders. Are there any of uh, like maybe more mom and pop type individuals that you feel like that individual's putting in the work um, and they, they should be shouted out. Oh yeah. There's some, uh, great, great breeders. I think, um, one of my favorites, local, uh, soaking beans up in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, they do a lot of great work. They do, uh, um, stuff with this bubble gum phenos and bubble gum. They've done where they've worked a lot with this bubble gum variety. And honestly, it's probably the most bubble gum, flavored phenos i've ran into in the open market so yeah soaking beans up in fort collins they're they're just a small you know little outfit but they definitely put in the work in and when you opinion. say when you say bubble gum because that was another thing that a lot of people used to argue about is is there bubble gum and then there's indiana bubble gum are you are we both saying the same damn thing um uh bubba gump or bubble gum bubble gum and then indiana bubble gum uh, I don't know if there's a difference between bubble gum and Indiana bubble gum. The bubble gum that I used to get that was like juicy fruit bubble gum was about a decade ago, and it was in the northern Colorado area. I haven't really ran into any other bubble gums that have compared, or I can even say, yeah, that's a bubble gum I ran into. That That's my only experience with bubble gum was in the northern Colorado area, and I'm pretty sure it was coming from those guys, but even back then. Yeah, that's an old school one right there, bubble gum. Yeah. yeah. Did, so you mentioned, uh, you said they were soaking beans? Soaking beans, yeah, up in yeah, Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm going to have to look them up. <coughs> How are you liking the, um, the um, Chimera stuff, man? Um, I saw you um, I'm, I'm loving the work that B-Leaf is doing. Me and him actually are doing a collab project right now where we're crossing my Dante 8. He sent me some Chimera 3 pollen. I'm crossing it to the Dante 8. Ooh. So, yeah, I really like the work B-Leaf is doing. Um, I think he's one of the better breeders out right now. 
Yeah, I like B-Leaf, man. I run I run his stuff every two or three times. I, I rock with B-Leaf for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And loving – Uh, you can find some Terps in there for sure, and you will get a winner in a pack. Like I said. just found a Chimera 3 Fino that literally tastes and smells like chocolate-covered cherries. Mm. And I've been looking for chocolate. I the, the last time I had a real chocolate Fino – was 20 plus years ago a friend of mine got some chocolate cavorkian from amsterdam mm. and it literally tasted and smelled like hershey kisses like i never to this day haven't found anything quite like it you know it's one of those one that sticks with me through all these years and when i found this bee leaf chimera 3 pheno recently like two weeks ago i was like blown away by the smell because it reminded me so much of that chocolate cavorkian and the taste is nearly the same, but it's got a little bit more of like a maraschino cherry flavor mixed in with the chocolate. Mm -hmm. I like I got a, a, some port wine out of a, a Chimera that I ran out of his, man. It, and it tasted just like a, that wine black and mild. If you ever had one of those, it was wild. Just uh -huh. smoky, uh -huh. just, just whiny. Really good, man. So, yeah, I love some people eat. Belief is starting to be like the like the Drake of the cannabis world. Like he works with everybody. And it seems yeah. like he's hitting home run after home run after home run. And, um, you know, we, well, that's, that's that's another thing where it goes down to passion. The man is passionate about what he does. He loves what he does. So it you know it manifests in a way that like it seems like he's doing more than anybody else. But it's not that. It's just that he loves what he does more than. The majority doing it why didn't you hit that with the dante's eight i mean i'm number six instead of the eight um so the six uh needs a little bit of work the six has a tendency to herm if it's stressed at all okay so i don't like to put the six out there in a way i'm, I'm working with so my plan is to reverse the eight hit that to the six and then hunt that for something more stable mm. um the six can be finicky, man. And like it to me, the risk is worth the reward. I, I've had it herm on me, but I've never had it. I don't think the herm, I don't think the pollen on it is viable because I've had it herm in the room and it's never pollinated anything. Okay. Now, have you so, ever heard of a, a male plant pollen not being viable? Because I saved some pollen. Absolutely. Thinking I was about to get some nope. shit popping. <laughs> and then I keep looking at these and I'm like, I ain't seeing no seeds, man. Uh-huh. You know? Not okay. only, not only um can it go bad after time, you know, um, sometimes it's just not viable. So that's something you have to test right away to make sure you're even working with something that can like you can have some male pawn. Like you said, you thought you had something, you were about to do some work, and then boom, you know, you didn't get anything out of it. You ain't doing nothing. Yeah. Right. And moisture also kills is a pollen killer. So you got to be really careful not to get any moisture on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was real particular on the drying. I think what it was, I took some really young plants. They they kind of force flower just by the nature of moving them around. I let them go ahead and flower. They you know they pollinated and oh, just nothing didn't get any good good pollen out of them. So it was weird. Yeah, yeah, I've had that happen to me too. So you're not the only one. All right, cool. Um, let me get back right quick to cost per run. What do you okay. what is is Athena expensive to run for the layman that says, Hey, I wonder if this is pricey? I don't think so. I think it's cheaper than the majority of the nutrients on the market. Like uh, let's say you in comparison to a company like Advanced Nutrients, where you're buying 99% water mm. in the bottle, and then what a little bit of nutrients that they put in there. Athena, you definitely get what you pay for. Um, it might be slightly more expensive than other salts, but then again, we're going back to that quality thing. Now, if you're using a nutrient where that's better quality and you're getting better results, that increase that usually better results means a larger yield. So if a larger yield, it's worth the extra $20 a bag that it might cost, you know, it, it, it's coming out to pennies per square foot. So it's worth it in my mind. If it's a little bit more than the next salt, it's worth it because of the R and D they go into when it comes to their products. They really do the research and development to make sure the consumer is getting the best quality salt on the market. Okay, and they and so what you're getting from them is concentrated, where it's not like right. Bottle. Okay. I run the Pro line, 
which is straight concentrated. Boom. Well, I mean, if hey, if you're gonna do it, you might as well not be shipping water across the damn country. You know what I mean? Right. Stick to just the base nutrients. At least you know we're doing it the as most the greenest we can be doing it. You know? Right. Now, you know, I see the commercials with that stuff and everything's state of the art and like hospital clean. Uh, we know that for most facilities, it's not like that. Uh, most people aren't running their operation at that kind of level. So when you're moving into your commercial side of things, you're using synthetics. How are you protecting that? What is your IPM method? Because, um, you know, I've, you know, as, as we move along everybody's growing the cannabis but you get you boys you know really taking it to the next level when you're able to protect the product um, right i think that goes a long way uh with ipm for a synthetic farmer just like it does with any other farm yeah i think ipm is a must um in any grow you know if you're not doing some type of pest management then your chances are you're going to run into issues eventually um when it comes to ipm you know i use the athena ipm which is great um, I use a few other organic. I so this is something you know. Hey, the the soil guys might like. I only use organic IPMs. You know, like uh, the soybeans, the capsum oils, the rosemary stuff like that. Um, you know, citrus oil, things like that. So I I, I don't uh, use any harsh chemicals when I'm growing. I'm a firm. I'm you know 100 against anything super harsh in my garden. I'm not trying to pass off anything uh you know chemical in nature to the consumer when you're uh when we're kind of talking about moving forward with some of uh, the genetics and stuff from what you're seeing it seems like when we're interviewing uh, a guest week after week uh now even marco's on board where most individuals just want to smoke concentrates you know at the level that you're at i would imagine you're thinking six months ahead a year ahead you know, you're dialing in a lot of these uh, breeders and their own genetics because you don't want to waste your time. So right. is there, you know, are you working kind of on your own stuff behind the scenes um, with belief and probably some other projects and stuff oh, so well, that you can 100%. streamline that for yourself? A hundred percent. So the, the main motivation in me sourcing all these genetics in the beginning was looking for the best of the best to use that as a launching point for my own genetics company. Um. You know, at, at the end of the day, I don't mind, you know, sh showcasing what these other breeders can do, but I'm a firm believer that um, nobody can showcase what I can do better than me. So yeah. if I, if it's, if I'm, you know, the one involved in the breeding process, in the growing process, um, in the distribution process, then you know, that's, that's kind of what I want to, in terms of building a legacy for my family. What is your, do you have a name for your, um, this, uh, you do right. It. So correct. So my genetics company is galactic gardens. Boom. Um, and I do everything right now. I'm doing everything under mile high. Dave galactic gardens is kind of just like, um, on paper, you know what I mean? I, I, I have I have the LLC, I have things incorporated and ready to go, but I haven't put out any seeds under that company yet. By summertime, that that will change. Okay. Is this collab with B Leaf going to be one of your first drops or the it absolutely drop? will? I have mm -hmm. uh seeds that are just finished up. They need about about 60 days to cure up, and then they'll be ready for their first round of testing. Once that testing is done then I'll be ready for the first seed drop, which I'm guessing is going to be towards the end of summer um, by fall at the latest. All right. Seed curing. Give me a, give me a little breakdown on that. So folks uh, well, know. seeds, seeds, what fresh seeds need about two months before they're viable for they're ready to be germinated. Um, if you try to germinate them sooner, chances are they won't germinate. So I don't know if you've ever, uh, heard of people complaining they bought seeds from breeders and that you know it, it's really shitty to spend 350 dollars on a pack and have a 50 percent germination rate mm -hmm. you know or 20 percent germination rate i just you know i just went through it i just spent 700 dollars on two packs and out of the two packs there's six seed, six seedlings that survived the rest yeah. did not germinate so not you know exactly. that's a lot of money flushed down the drain uh for hype 
So I'm trying to avoid that by making sure the things that I put out are going to be good for the consumer and not, you know, just, I'm not just trying to sell hype. I'm trying to sell the best out there that I can find. That's right. Those are the things we always talk about on this show, man. Start with quality first. Everything else will follow. You know, you yes. can't start with trying to get the bag. You know, the bag comes after the deeds and the work has been done. Absolutely. I don't focus on money, man, and I make great money, and that's not, like not my focus at all. I just focus on what I do. Focus on looking for the best that I can find from this cannabis plant. I mean, she has so many expressions. It's like, you know, it's never ending on what you can find. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it the most is, um, you know, right when I find something good, I'm like, oh, this is the best I ever found. And then boom, here comes something better. <laughs> so that's the thing that I love about it the most. And I don't think that'll ever go away. Um, you know, when I find something new, I'm like, oh, shit, here's something that's even better than that one I thought was the best. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm constantly chasing. Yeah, me too, man. That's the, that's the thing to chase right there. And I'm and you got to be hard. You got to be picky. Like. My dad still talks about some strains that I, man, what about this one? I said, no, I, well, I didn't care for it that much, but, you know, other people might love it. You know what I mean? But I just, yes. if it's not just to that highest peak, then I try to, I don't keep running it because I feel like. I'm That's why I have a diverse library because not everybody, like, right, the last couple of years I've been on this heavy sugar turp hunt, uh, fruity, artificial, candy, you know, I've been looking for that, but there, I still keep things that are super gassy for the people that just love that. You know, so you got to got to have something for everybody's taste buds, because I think that's the two main categories is like the sugar candy and then the gasoline, you know, mm -hmm. and you get a little funk in there, you know, trying to right. skunk is kind of having its own little category, too. Hey, I love I still love that old school skunk. Number one, man, I love skunk. I, I, best compliment I ever had was when somebody came in, here in my house and said, it smells like skunk in here. They didn't know I grew up. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like inside. I was like, yes. But mm -hmm. also inside, I was like, oh shit, got to tighten up that ventilation, you know. But um, yeah, man, no doubt. So strain wise, loving that belief, starting your own stuff. That's awesome, man. I definitely will um be in line to grab a pack of those. Thank you. Um, and then so from there, you're just gonna kind of keep working your own stuff and just getting deeper into it and offering more to the masses, huh? Yeah, I think uh, my ultimate goal is to build my genetic library to a point to where I'm supplying commercial grows all over the country. Um, my philosophy in that is, you know, most commercial growers, they're not they're not doing any pheno hunt. They don't want to do the pheno hunting. They don't have time for that. You have a commercial grow, you're starting it up to make money. So if I can do all that legwork for you and just supply you with the genetics that's tried, you know, proven, tried and true, ready to go, you know, going to hit three alike guaranteed as long as you follow the SOPs, you know, that that's what I'm looking to do. So you're looking to kind of have a catalog eventually like belief. And I would imagine you have your own kind of, he was saying he has his like point system that he rates all of his genetics on. It sounded incredibly detailed, um, you know, almost like, in awe when he was explaining it of how, how detailed it is. Yeah. Well, right now I have like about 40 solid phenos out of the 40 solid phenos. I've probably let out maybe a dozen or so to the masses. Um, I have stuff that I haven't even shown people. I have stuff that, you know, is incredible that I've never posted a picture of. So just kind of saving that stuff for as we get into it, like, you know, I'll just kind of let stuff out more and more. Like I have tons of content um, that's unreleased on, on all kinds of strains that I've, you know, haven't let out yet. And um, yeah, man, I think it's my ultimate goal is to just have this catalog of just the best of the best that I found over the years and make it available to um for to any grower whether it be commercial or even you know, commercial is the ultimate goal in terms of a monetary gain but i also like to provide it to anybody um in the industry that would like to grow it whether they be a tent grower or commercial grower as a matter of fact one of the things that i have coming up is um i'm going to start the ma high club and we know everybody wants to join the ma high club right? yeah. <laughs> So it's going to work like this. It's going to be a subscription service 
for 250. So normally I say, I don't know if you guys know, but normally I sell my cuts for $2,000 a Fino. And I get that consistently. Now this is one that you just discovered only one of one off any, any Fino that I've hunted that I posted on Instagram. Um, a person can purchase for me for two thousand dollars. Gotcha. Or if they buy multiples, I do deals as well. Okay. Um, okay. So the Mile High Club is for all the people who can't afford that two thousand dollar price, and they actually might get a better deal in the long run. So what I'm going to do with that is for two hundred fifty dollars a year, it's a su subscription service bi monthly. You will get one cut from my keeper garden of my choice, not your choice bi-monthly so you'll get six of my cuts during the year for 250 dollars and they'll versus be having to pay two thousand dollars for one pheno so basically it's like a twelve thousand dollar value for 250 bucks i just get to pick which one you get and i'm not you know you, everything will go out there's nothing that's going to be excluded like oh this is the best it's not going to go out everything everybody's going to get something of something so you might get the, the best cut in my garden. You might get, you know, some other cut, but you're going to get something every other month for that price. That's a great marketing strategy, man. I like that. That's, that's, and that's good because I like that, man. A lot of people don't give back, you know, give an opportunity for the smaller guy to get in. The right. Game, right. And so, I understand right. not everybody can afford the $2,000. The reason why I've kept that price point is to kind of keep the genetics a little bit more ex exclusive and to keep it from just being totally like, you know, bastardized. Like I'm not trying, you know, it's like when you just let it go for just dirt cheap and everybody has it, then it's, there's really no value to it. Um, the higher price point makes it a little bit more exclusive, which, you know, drives the value up. People want something. It's kind of like Louis Vuitton. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you might want Louis V, but you can't get Louis V with a couple hundred bucks. You got to have Louis V money. Mm -hmm. But so now I'm going to offer the Louis Vuitton to everybody with a couple hundred bucks but you just get a, a Louis V of my choice, not yours. Yeah. Louis ain't even doing that. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. My point. Exactly. So, uh, right. you know, that, that could prove to be fairly lucrative if I can get it, let's say a few thousand subscribers. Yeah, definitely, man. And so basically what you're saying is now you've hunted a pack or a line, found this one Dante's Inferno number six or whatever. That's your exclusive now. And now right. you're saying, hey, I'm offering this if you guys want to see so what you did was you did the legwork of um, hunting through the seed for the consumers, basically. Working. Years. It literally took two years to find the phenos that I found. That's years of legwork. Mm -hmm. So by eliminating that for a commercial cultivator, even this average tent grower, that's like, dude, a ton of legwork. You don't got to worry about. Like, not only that, I can say, hey, this pheno has gotten three of light outdoor. It's gotten three of light under HPS, double-ended. It's got three of light under LEDs. This is a three of lighter, no matter what you put it under, is if you even have minimal grow skills. Is that you don't part have to of be your, a master grower. Is that part of your selection? Do you factor in the per lighter in, yes. in that? Okay. Everything I keep hits between two and a half and three and a half of light. I don't keep anything less than that. God. Another one for, for that, again, for that, uh, for marketing purposes, like people are looking for things that they're, they're going to produce that they can make money off of. So, you know, a commercial cultivator, yeah, you want a three, a lighter versus a one, a lighter or a two, a lighter, because that's going to give you the most money. Yeah. Now there would be a, a, a I'm sure there's a, a, a caveat to that crazy terp. Yes. Un, you know, un yes. smelled yeah. turp before would kind yes. of overrule a little bit of that. Yes. I, I as a matter of fact, I, I just found one recently. Now it's a runt, it's a really short plant, but the turp profile and the look is astronomical. So I said, How can I still use this? So I said, I got it. I told my buddy, I said, look, we're gonna market this as a low clearance pheno. <laughs> if you have rack systems or just not a lot of clearance this is the pheno for you it's super short but it produces best quality flower and it produces it actually gave me a little bit over to a light which isn't bad hmm. that's 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 right. solid too. That ain't right for a short thing. plant i was like dang this thing was this thing is not i'm definitely going to keep this and like you know lo low clearance pheno and i have a couple like that so you know, people with not a lot of headroom can can still grow something super fire, not have to worry about it stretching into their lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's just taking that and making a new opportunity with something that nature gave you. So. Right. Yeah. 
Do you right. mind uh, kind of saying some of the genetics? I guess some people are interested. Um, you know, your your Instagram's Mile High Day Four Twenty. Um, and do you mind maybe sh shooting out some of the genetics you think our community might want to check out? Uh, through there's some chatter in the, the chat about all that. Um, genetics in terms of that I've grown. Stuff like you know, you're, you're saying uh, all your stuffs were two Gs, right? Which is a bold claim, and so people. Well, I I, I won't. I, so this is what I say. Um, any pheno that I've hunted, I sell for two grand, whether you think it's worth that or not. Um, the reason why I sell it for two grand, because any pheno that I've hunted, I put it at least a year and a half of work into. I've run it at least three to four times before I ever put it out there and say, this is something for sale. So I did all the testing. I did all the work. You know, uh, my light bill's not cheap. You know, my, my grow wasn't cheap. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on R and D. Like I said, I spent, sometimes I might spend a thousand dollars on packs and get three seeds out of there that are viable. So, you know, there's a lot of, of, um, overhead on my end that I go through to where I feel like it justifies this price point of $2,000. Now, again, that's not a hard price point. There are some things that I work out with people. Like, let's say you're a commercial grower and you want, 500 or a thousand cuts. Okay. Anything over 500, I do the same thing, but $20 a piece. So I'll give you five phenos. You want 500 cuts. I'll give you five phenos for $20 a piece. And if you do the math, it still equals two grand per genetic. Really, that's what I'm selling the genetic. I don't really care about the amount of cuts as much as per se as the genetic itself. So even for like a, the the single light like grower, I mean, for that, even if you wanted to go out on a limb, and so it, was, it wouldn't even be going out on a limb. It would be investing in you for two Gs and your time, and you you could recoup that in you know, a couple flips. You know, what I mean, right. it's not it's not the end of the world. I get it. You know, what I mean, it's I, not I like, listen. I understand the price is not for everybody. I totally understand that the price I've told people this in my DMS. Listen, I understand, man, the price is not for everybody, which is why I've come up with the mile high club, which I believe is a price point for everybody. You know and, what I mean? And I think, uh, like, you know, obviously some people are feel some way that other people want to know if they've never heard of you before two G's. Right. So what are some of the genetics you feel like are tried and true? If somebody wanted to, uh, Dante's you like Inferno that. number eight, right. definitely tried and true, guaranteed. Like if you've spent two grand on that, you're going to make your money back on the first run if you're running more than two lights and you even have a medium level of grow proficiency. Because there's also that part of um, recouping that, you know, the streets wants. They want it again, you know, and if it's and if it's that if it's that kind of uh, turp, you know, people are going to want it again and again. No, so. Absolutely. So that's the thing about the Dante six. Now I was saying like it has a tendency to herm when stress, but I'm actually scaling scaling that one up right now because so many people want it. Um, it it's actually I entered it in the Colorado Connoisseur Cup, which is a seven month blind judging competition. And it's gone on to the final round. We'll find out if you know what who the winners are in about a month here. But you know, I feel really good about it because I know that it's so unique that every single person who has smelled it has just been like, wow, what is this? And that's the thing. It's the reaction that really tells me this is something I should try to comp compete with. You know, it's that reaction. Like every single person, there wasn't been one person, even my wife, she doesn't even smoke. And when I open that up, she's like, oh, my God, babe, like, what is that? Like, that smells so crazy. She's like, geez, like, what is that? She's like, God, right, let me smell that again. And like, she doesn't smoke. Right. So if a non-smoker is like, wow, what is that? What does that tell you? You got something special, man. You know, mm -hmm. I know it's something special. So we'll see if she wins. Um, yeah, you guys definitely check out the Colorado Con Connoisseur Cup. Seven-month blind ju judging competition. I think one of the realist competitions in the state man so I, seven months god damn yes. what are they doing what, what's that process just they get so out they set up what? judging sessions okay. like let's say you can come through with a group of eight friends to their little compound and you sit down and they have uh all the jars have numbers on them and they have a hundred point judging system hmm. how much did you have to enter as far as your ounces 
uh, I entered about an ounce each. Okay. Um, and then, so a round, I believe, lasts like a month or two. They have several rounds. And then, so I entered an ounce per round. Nice. Good luck with that, man. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can't. I, I like the concentrates, but I gotta maintain my flower because I got stuff right now being judged as well, and I and I'm I have my own that I'm you know seeing it through as they're you know as the judges have it. I want to know kind right of what they're doing with it. So yeah, definitely, man. That unique, I think, is key, man. Especially though, if you're entering a competition, everybody likes something that they have, you know have have not smelled before. You know, right? Well, that's why I try to stay away from anything that's familiar in terms of. Uh, uh, when I'm looking for phenos, anything that's really a familiar smell, I shy away from, unless it's a familiar smell from decades ago. Okay. Yeah. I then mean, I'm more drawn to it. Like I found this, uh, emergency pheno from Sea Junkie that literally smells and tastes like OG Kush from 20 plus years ago. Keeper. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's incredible. Like I still, I haven't grown it out in a while, but I still got my mom there, you know, anytime I want to. I was going to ask you, do you just keep moms in you know, big pots or what do you do? On that? So I tend to uh, recycle my moms every six months or so. Um, once they get, you know, about eight feet or more, I tend to chop them down. I usually have like a, a small teen ready to take its place yeah. at yeah. that point. Well, yeah, when it comes to moms... What's your view on that when it starts to get like a little bit of that woody feel to it? it starts to almost bark out, you know? Um, do you feel like those are still viable or you kind of just. Yeah, like, usually like it starts to get like that about after six months is when I tend to, to tend to chop them. I tend to call my moms every six months. I don't usually like to let them go longer than that. Um, that's just a practice I've always had. And I think more individuals now they do more like a perpetual harvest. Um, so that was interesting to, I guess you have a, if you're selling cuts, you need that. That's uh, yeah. Education. You, when you say perpetual, do you mean they just take cuttings of cuttings? Yeah. There's usually like, um, it's kind of like they have a mom for each round. So they just kind of take from. To, to right. Sure. Yeah. You, yeah. I, I know guys that do that. I tend to like to keep my moms around as long as possible to keep the generations from. Uh, the, so genetic drift is a real thing. But I also think um, from what I see, if you keep the strongest of your cuttings for the next generation mom, that, that genetic drift is, doesn't really happen as much. So like, it was, like usually you get the drift when you keep the you weaker. Feel, uh, you're familiar with uh, ethos genetics? Because he uh -huh. he's, he's made a pretty compelling argument to me why, why that the genetic drift doesn't exist. So maybe a uh, future show we could just, we can uh, show well, the community that we can have uh, disagreements yeah, I, on things. Yeah, and still... I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't because, uh, like, you can't don't don't quote me on that as fact. When I say genetic drift is is real, uh, so what I mean by that is um, when you have a smaller runtier plant or clone, and you tend to take that as your next mom, you'll notice differences in the final product, and that's probably that could have to do with genetic drift, which is what. I've heard as the explanation that could also be have to do with like, uh, you know, viroids or pathogens. Sometimes like HLV is in HLVD is in everybody's garden, I believe. Um, you think I test so? for it. I, I've had it in my own garden. I've tested, you know, gotten rid of the plants, but I believe it's something that um, if you do the research on it, it's actually been around for decades since like the 60s. So it was probably in people's gardens before any of us were ever testing for it. And I think it like when it expressed itself, people would be like, oh, this runty, like all these clones, but this one looks runty and weird. Throw that one out. That was probably the one that was expressing the HLVD, even though everything else in the garden has it. I could see that because just like anything else, man, when things are kind of imbalanced, good and bad can be right there. So right. that, 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 that could make sense for sure. And right. a lot of this is coming about when people are taking that runty or that plant that's not as healthy kind of probably nursing it back and then trading it and doing all that. Right. And then, like, and a lot of times that, that plant won't give you the same end result product as the one that was more healthy in the beginning. And they'll take that as genetic drift, but that really could just be the lack, the fact that you started with a plant that was less healthy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I have heard that for sure. Definitely right. starting with run team, the beat up clones, it doesn't uh, help your end product for sure. Right. So I guess you I, I call it drift, call it whatever you want. It's just not the same as if you started with a more healthy, healthy plant. What was that gentleman saying, Brian? More like it's exactly the same. It, for, it would take thousands of years for the drift to take place. Is that kind of what he was saying? Or, and that, that uh, actually makes sense. All right. So he's on another level, man. Um, as, as I would say the basic way I could break it down is he's saying a plant that doesn't um, – in, in nature doesn't live as long as that. So what you're really doing is just growing out plants, mothers – longer than you should now you're you're having weaker genetics um and, and that's where that's actually coming from um and I, I probably butchered that from a from a scientific aspect but he that makes he a little bit of down. sense though yeah i, I kind of i kind of get what you're saying yeah I can get and that. this is yeah this is upper level stuff man i like i like to smoke it i love that we have the show where we can talk <laughs> about it but to break it down where these breeders especially some of those elite breeders can can uh discuss uh it's it's you know, eye-opening, and so I think that'd be even a fun topic just to just to open. Absolutely, some of those and, and even boxes. though I know how to breed myself, I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not an elite breeder. I'm still learning a lot of aspects of breeding on a daily basis myself. I'm, you know, I'm constantly looking to improve my craft. So uh, breeding, as I get into it more, I'll I'll just be learning more daily. You know, definitely. That's the that's the key to it, man. Is learning every day. You think you got it down? You think you got some pollen? You figured out how to store it right, and then you, you know, you, you, it's not viable. So it's always right. good to learn in <laughs> right. the process, man. Man, all right. I you like that to... Mile High Club though. That, that that sounds like a winner, man. I like that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, man. Everybody wants to join the Mile High Club. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I guess uh, just to, to clarify again, be, besides like the Dante Inferno, do you have some other genetics that you think individuals would want to pop off with? I, I've seen a couple of people asking about that. Still. Um, in my garden personally or just in general? Well, like if, like if I would, I guess, so I sell these fancy isopods, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them command a certain price point. I, I guess if some people didn't know how long it was, you know, they'd probably laugh at me too, right? Right. So, so I, when I explained that to him, I would say like, you know, the Cubara species. So these genetics are the ones that you would want to put 2K on. Are there some other genetics that you want to try to help you sell uh, cuts if you if you really want to? Because um, you got to respect it, man. And, and I know some people feel a certain way, too. But if a man's willing to put it out there and the, the genetics. I would say it, that I have something for everybody. I don't think that anything in my garden in terms of keepers that I kept really like surpasses anything else. Like, like I said, I have, if you're, if you're a sugar candy Terp guy, I got the, I got the, the cut for you. If you're a gasoline guy and you like, like deep purple, I got the cut for you. If you're somebody that wants something in between, I got the cut for you. They're all at the same price point because I believe they're all equally good. They all produce equally well. They're just on different flavor spectrums for different taste pro taste, you know, tastes mm. out there. So it really depends on what you mm. like. Uh, if there's a particular flavor profile you're looking for, chances are I have it for you. So would you say that like, all right, if I'm I'm a young guy and I'm I want to start breeding, so I'm gonna hit mile high Dave up for some cuts. Now, am I gonna be is that gonna be stable stuff where I can kind of take that? Oh yeah. And everything I sell, like I said, everything I sell, I've run multiple times. So I don't, I don't ever release anything. And this is why I don't really release the Dante six anymore is because it has that slight tendency to Herm. So, you know, that's not something the average grower wants to deal with. So therefore, like, even though in my mind, the risk is worth the reward, that might not be everybody else's mind. I've had guys who have got that cut actually, and have freaked the fuck out and destroyed their whole gardens because they saw some Herms. Um, and I've also had guys that have got that cut, saw some herms, trimmed them off and grew it out and, and loved it more than anything. So, you know, it, it's really, um, I do think I have something for everybody. Uh, if I, if it comes to like, what do I recommend that I have that I've hunted? I think right now, some of the best stuff that I have is the Dante's Inferno, um, the pink Z Skittles, the ripped off runts from Sea Junkie is probably like my top three. 
You you feel like people are still people are still rocking with the runs here in Denver? I'm kind of out of the loop on that. Um, this ripped off runs Fino I have is a little bit different than uh, the runs that was floating around. And like I said, we like runs is something now. Even it really comes down to phenotypes. Like I've had some runs out there that are candy. I've had runs out there that are crazy gassy. So it really just depends on who you're getting it from, in my opinion. What do you think? Um, what would you recommend? All right, being an older guy, much experience in the game, knowing how to grow, growing all kinds of genetics, telling a young guy, would you say invest in a pack of seeds or go to a clone, you know, kind of a, a established clone? I would say how much time do you have? Okay. So if you have time, I would say invest in the seeds. If you don't have any time and you're looking for immediate profit, I would say invest in the clones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. As if you have, for, if, yeah, if you have time and you're, and then, you know, like for me, I love pot. I don't think I'll ever stop popping packs of seeds, no matter how many good cuts I have. Some people don't want to deal with any of that. They just want to find the good cut to grow. So if that's what you're looking for, I say, just buy the cut. You know, if you're looking, if you enjoy the thrill of the hunt, like me, buy the seeds. If you're just looking for that one good cut, look for that one good cut and buy it and just grow it up. What did he say? He wanted a 50 day, 30. <laughs> good luck, homie. Yeah, man. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I will tell you, man, I, I shout out to uh, Genome. Uh, I need to give him a, um, a report back on his stuff, Genome Alchemy, um, his Fantasia. I'm running it again, but, I mean, wonderful stuff. I found one that went 58 days, so I'm running them again. I got to make sure I got three phenos uh, running them again, man. But that 58 day, that would be key. I'm going to be excited if that if that comes in, you know, again, 58 and 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 terpy as it was so yeah man like supporting you know good good breeders with good genetics to me that's how that's that's been the key because i'm i'm man over the years think about all the stuff you bought different seeds shit that didn't produce or did grow and it wasn't what they said it was you know so that adds up man so it is important man when you're starting out you got to invest in something at least quality and and let me just add on top of that not only supporting the breeder but i think it's really important i think a lot of people even lose sight of this it's really important for the breeder so to support the grower that's making them look good um amen to that i'm not going to name any names but i've had breeders try to play me several big breeders in the industry have tried to play me already like like a fiddle you know um and from terms of hey man give me if you give me all your best cuts that you've hunted, I'll give you seeds. And you're you're just your association with us is like promotion. Oh, for you, like, like, <laughs> like so yeah, basically, people always say that. Basically, Exposure. he wants me to give right. him yeah. all my years of fucking hunting and work, and in return, he's gonna give me more seeds, which pushed me back at step one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then they're gonna take those seeds. They're going to take my cuts, breed with it, make seeds, make, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, and in return, give me seeds. So, yeah, yeah I, I've had some weird offers come at me, man. I've had breeders uh, tell me that I couldn't sell my cuts on their, uh, on the site they were affiliated with and then buy my cut and then take my pictures off of Instagram and use my name to try to sell the cut. Oh, anyway. Damn. Yeah. So I've had some crazy stuff happen. Um, so, yeah, on that note, my thing is this. If you're a breeder out there, take care of the growers that make you look good because not all the growers are dummies. And you try to play the wrong one, and it's going to come back and bite you. Yeah, that's a mean world there, cold world. You yep. ever uh, you ever met Gino Malcomy? Who? Gino Malcomy. His name's Greg. Uh-uh. Man, y'all might. I mean, it's he's a... Uh, what I like is like two different worlds. So you get both you boys would represent the, obviously the two different worlds. He's, he's um, obviously more on this side of the fence. Right. But I think when you're talking breeding and that kind of thing, I've always kind of sat back in awe sometimes it used to be at the Indo expos where you'd hear just bright minded people kind of breaking stuff down when everybody's passing around and getting stung. Um, 
And a lot of his stuff and, and probably other individuals that you know, they're not about the hype. So the good stuff is really more you got to do the research yourself in your local area. Find those individuals that are tried and true that might not necessarily be the biggest social media like savant um, because, right. that's, you know, they're too busy putting in the work in the, in the garden and that's the kind of stuff. And more people right. have realized that uh, getting burned on the back end uh, by putting up the money like you had spoke on where you think, oh, all right. Especially when you first start out, man, you think that you would get better, or at least in my experience, I thought I would get some better genetics for the amount of money that I spent on it. Granted, I was, you know, my skill sets weren't there and stuff, but it still Bro, didn't feel right. I spent right. over $10,000 and 80% of that stuff was just trash. And that's where it ended up in the garbage. You know, and that's just because a lot of those breeders, they're not... They're not taking the time to make sure they're putting out good stuff. They're just pumping it out. Like I know, I, I know for a fact, there's a lot of breeders out there. They just make like F1 regs, right? And they put them out there. And then when guys like me find keepers, they turn around, buy the keeper from the, from the grower and then sell that as their breeder cut. <laughs> So, yeah bizarre bro like don't do any That's work slick. at all just like put out cuts and try to make money off of other people's work it's it's just out there to me just bizarre so uh that's why I kind of like one of the other things that kind of pushed me into breeding my own stuff too is like i you know i don't like that feeling of doing all this work and then have somebody saying well i made the seeds i deserve all the credit you know like, yeah, you deserve your credit. I'm not going to like, uh, you know, good breeding stock is is half the battle. If I don't have good breeding stock, I'm never going to find anything good. So I appreciate the breeders and everything that they do. But I don't like feeling underappreciated by breeders who think they're going to either take advantage of me, use me or walk all over me because, you know, I, I work too hard for what I do. Like if I put in three years hunting your gear to find the best of the best, you should respect that. So what are your thoughts on when when can you change that name or when do you you know like you got you know you got a pack you're gonna start you're hunting it you find something when can you kind of make my it whole thing is so on naming stuff is if a pack doesn't have a name like let's say it just had a cross on the pack that's wide open to name any single female if the if the cross on the pack was like chop cookies times gelato 33 you can name that whatever pheno whatever you want if the pack already had a name like for instance like dante's inferno already had a name um again i feel like you can name it whatever you want but i like to give those packs that already have i like to call it the same name and just give it a number you know um and that's my respect to the breeder now, if I take that and I make something else with it, like let's say my Dante's Inferno Mahai Dave cut, that's probably the most well-recognized, well-known Fino out of all the ones I've hunted, Mahai Dave cut. So if I take something, if I take that and I make something else with it, you know, that to me in my mind is free reign. You know, once you take that, you make something else, you do whatever you want. But at the end of the day, it's a plant. I try not to get, you know, all in my feelings about it, you know, it's a plant. It's there for all of us to enjoy. So if you can, if you find something beautiful from it and you want to name it, whatever the fuck you want to name it, do that. You know, don't let nothing stop you. You don't owe anybody any loyalties. If you bought a pack from a breeder and you paid your hard earned money for it, you deserve to do whatever you want with the seeds that you cultivate. I think uh, I, I can agree with that. I think though, as on my, for the way I look at it, I, I like to give, I like to keep a little bit of that original name in there. And what that does is it doesn't like, all right, a, a big part of um, people of color, color, they try to take our history, right? When you don't know your history, you don't, it, it takes a lot from you. So it's the same way with plants. Like if you go just now put this out and cut the history off, now what people are getting, they don't quite know what they got. You know, and there's like so much of that in the cannabis industry. It's sad. All these people, um, you know, take other people's work and want to profit off it without giving any recognition because 
Oh, I, once they have the, like I said, it's a plant. So once you have the plant and they all look like just like any other plant until you actually flower it out, you can call it whatever you want. You know, I know, I know seed junkie at one time used to give out all kinds of testers and stuff. And he stopped doing that because so many people started genetic companies off of his testers. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I, I mean, I get it. I understand their motivation. Like, yeah, they want to do your own thing. It's like, uh, Somebody was saying to me the other day, what it was like, you know, in terms of learning something from somebody and they're like, man, you don't, you don't, you don't get mad when somebody, you know, they, they, you teach them how to do something, then they just go do it. And I said, listen, that's the nature of progression. If you're learning something from someone and you don't reach a point to where you want to do it on your own, you're not fucking learning anything. Period. So if you learn, no matter what your craft is, if you're learning, um, you should always want to, at some point, say, I've learned enough. I want to do this on my own. You know, so I don't get upset at anybody that wants to do their own thing. I try to pay respect to uh, the breeders that respect me. If I feel disrespected or if you outright disrespect me in any way and what I do, then I just don't mess with you no more. I don't do business with you. You're not getting any promotion from me whatsoever. And there's a couple like that already. I mean, it, you know, it is what it is. It's the nature of any business. There's never going to be 100% good people who are stand up in any industry and cannabis included. Even though we do this for the love, not everybody does this for the love. Yeah, it seems like about 50-50 sometimes. Like, you know, half the people want to do the right thing. The other half just want to get into the pockets of the people that want to do Exactly. Right. All about profit. Yeah. That's what's and, annoying about it, man, because there's room for everybody. Exactly. And even with seeds, if anybody's ever bred seeds or even had something pollinate on you, man, you get freaking hundreds of seeds. You know, 50 seeds can be in a bud sometimes. You know what I mean? So... That's why a lot of guys uh, do, you know, spread that love and share those genetics. But on the same token, you do kind of want to get a little recognition if you if you did the work in a way, you know. But in a way, that's flattery, you know, when they're trying to rip you off and be you and sell shit in your name, make accounts, you know, to, to look like you. Oh, yeah. I got a scam accounts on Instagram are ridiculous. I got those guys, too. I just... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, I just don't I just don't understand. Like if they put that same energy into doing something legitimate, like those guys could be great. Like why put all that energy into ripping people off? I know. Bizarre. <laughs> don't make sense, man. But that's how that's what we deal with. Yeah, bizarre. Yeah, man. So, um, yeah, definitely, man. Seeds. I, I love popping seeds. To me, that's key. That's how you can always find something new. You know, that new turf. You know. I found that uh, the burnt electricity, kind of that electrical fire turf, you know, it sounds crazy, but I'm running it again. I want to see if that's actually in there, man, because it's something that I have never smelled before. And I, you know, so I want to run it again, you know, definitely. I always recommend running things two, three times myself too, man, for you. Absolutely. Really, yeah. Before you give a good review on it. Absolutely. Cause you can run something, you know, one time and, and run it again and it's not, not the same. So that's why I say I run things two, three times before I ever put it out to market. Yeah. My dad, man, I, he ran this, this strain that was like from a seed bank that was not even reputable, right? Ran it. That was fire. So frosty, so nice under OHPS that I gave him. I'm like, damn, well, I want this. I took it, ran it under LED. It was bunk. Like, <laughs> so I, I was like, it didn't make yeah. sense, you know. And That's what I was saying. Like my Dante Eight, it's been run under every condition, uh, LED, outdoor, HPS, and every single cultivator who's run it has been like, dude, this thing is just it throws down like it's beautiful. Send me pictures. I'm like, okay, this is one that does well in any condition. Yeah, I noticed a lot of times though, man, stuff seems like when it's like fire indoors. I, I mean, limited experience since we just want to legalize outdoor here recently. But the little stuff I've grown where it's been really fire indoors and then take it outdoors, it's different. You know what I mean? And, and so I'm Absolutely. really looking to find those strains that are also good for outdoors. It's That's very cool. rare that you find phenos that do well in any lighting situation. 
Mm-hmm. And you say your Dante's eight or the mile high? Yeah, cut the Dante right? eight mile high Dave cut does well in in any outdoor light depot, LED, HPS. Every single person I've known, organic grown. Um, my um, Lion Bolt Farms runs that cut, and they run organic no till, you know, soil, living soil, and uh, they have phenomenal results with it. Looks beautiful. Comes out same flavor profile great so um i got a buddy up in aspen that runs it outdoors light depot in the spring if he sends me pictures it looks beautiful so i know that it does well i have another buddy that here in in, in um up in fort collins area that runs it in uh, hps and it does again does beautiful so i know that it does well under any conditions i run it consistently with leds and i've never been disappointed Speaking of disappointed, uh, when you're pheno hunting, are you are you sometimes like going through auto packs, or is that not in your wheelhouse with with your style? Are you running through feminized seeds, or is everything regs? Like, what's your philosophy? On um, I, I usually pop regs or fems. Um, I've been doing more fems lately because regs can, you know, they're just more work. I I tend to send the regs off for sex testing after a few weeks to kind of weed out the males early. Um, but even then like regs, so with fems, I, you tend to find more of, uh, more herms with regs, you know, you just have less females. So th- those are like the pros and cons with regs. I find you get more diverse phenos and often better phenotypes than with fems, but fems can give you really good phenos, especially depending on the fem type. Like if you get a good S1 you can find something better than the original, you know, very possible. Yeah, that's my experience too with the S1s, man. They can be better for sure. Right. Just have a tendency to herm a little bit more in my opinion. Yeah, we, uh, you know, Marco and I want to respect your time, sir. So there's just uh, five questions here that we kind of want to rapid fire to. Yeah, no worries. Um, early on, somebody wanted to, uh, rotten skateboards. Here it is. My bad. I uh, wanted to know about, uh, do you add fulvic acids to Athena feeds? No, I don't add anything to the Athena feed. I just use, I run the ProLine only. I don't add any extra addi- additives or anything like that. What is that? Three, you said that's three inputs with the ProLine? Yeah, three inputs. Um, three salts. And then they have the balance, which is, um, you know, their pH up. And then they have the core, or the, they have the cleanse, the balance, core. Um, and uh, the grow and the bloom. So, you know, during um, veg, I'm using the grow. During flower, I'm using the bloom. But all the other ingredients pretty much stay the same. Just the ratios are adjusted slightly. Here's kind of a more of that rapid fire because you... You went over this, but any anything to add uh, to your answer beforehand? Um, I run ThinkGrow LEDs. Uh, the genetics I run can vary. Uh, I'm constantly pheno hunting, like I said, so there's always some new genetics in the room as, lo- as well as old genetics. Um, I have three tables, so I tend to run the tried and true genetics on two tables, and I tend to run pheno hunts on one table. You know, so it's always multiple things being run in the room. Um, I'm running ThinkGrow LEDs. I run them with the UV lights during the last four weeks to speed up resin production as well as they help them finish a little early. So I tend to get like um, 70 day results out of 64 days. Are you are you running? Uh, are you flooding the tables? Or are you doing drip? Um, I flood the tables. Okay. I have drippers, but they're like fast drippers, not slow ones. Anything to add to this one? So I found the strain Dante's Inferno Mile High Cut. The strain was created by Clearwater Buds. And I believe Tiki Man Man was a collab. But from what I understand, Clearwater did all the breeding on that one. Um, the Mile High Dave Cut is the one that I hunted. Took me about two years to find along with the number six cut. So yeah, that's the one that I put out the most. Um, that's the one that I'm probably most known for.
Um, when they say, is he talking about what are they referring to? Uh, well, this is a, uh, I said a lot of things about breeders. <laughs> yeah. I think this is up more when you were kind of like talking about some breeders that are more mom and pop. Um, I think that was when this, this question came up. So, okay. Yeah. The, Pe so people love hearing that. That's, that's yeah. kind of who they want to support. Are, are the Soaking people. beans is definitely more of a mom and pop operation and they're local. They're local to Northern Colorado. Yeah. And this is the last question for you. Hmm. Can I compare Athena to Jax One Two Three and Master Blend Tomato? Um, I, can, I haven't used Jax One Two Three or Master Blend Tomato, so I cannot compare them. Marco, you have any experience with Jax? Oh, no, man, this man just talking to you was bringing back a lot of memories. You know, like you know, just salts and all that good stuff, man. Um, that's not so good anymore to me, you know what I mean? But, um, I remember the days, man. And it sounds like at least from the sense of using the salts and, and, and you, you know, it seems like Athena has at least dialed it down, um, to where, you know, I remember there used to be like eight to 10 different bottles and concoctions of shit that would be with some of these lines, you know what I mean? Um, and it really got crazy. So, well, I think that, a lot of that's a money grab. Yeah, it's not even know. a necessity. It's just a money grab. That's why I like Athena. Like, yeah, okay, they're a company that wants to make money, but they're not just trying to grab money from your pockets at every angle. They actually do things for the culture, right? Which right. I respect highly. Yeah, and that's what that's what it seems like. Um, kind of now, if you were into it, yeah, that would be a much better option than some of these things that I've used in the past, like money grabs, sending ninety percent water and all that shit in the mail. You know, or buying it, all the same. But um, definitely. And and for the for the you know the audience, man, we appreciate everybody. And this is a show for growers, man. We're not always um gonna have everybody that's all about like minded and doing everything exactly like you do because you don't really grow that way. You know what I mean? So, um, we're trying to give everybody the options to, to you know speak their mind, say what they're working with, and and, and talk growing. You know, that's that's all. Hey, and like I said, I I appreciate everything organic growers do. I, I or organic growers have given me some of the best smoke I've ever had. So I'm not gonna, you know, knock it the process in any way, shape, or form. I I say there's more than one ways to skin a cat. You know what I mean? Just because uh, um, there there's more than one way to make a fancy dish. You know. So we're, we're all here cooking it up. I think, you know, as long as your, your end result is something that the consumer says, yeah, I like that. That's all that matters. Yeah, that's key. That's definitely key, man. You were all cooking it up. And um, most of the time we're just eating our own food anyway. So, you know, if you, if you want that <laughs> organic, cook that organic. You know what I mean? That's, that's what right. I say. If you want to rock with the sauce, rock with them, try them. Hey, it's up to you, man. As far as food goes, I only eat organic food, so I'm not knocking the organic lifestyle at all. <laughs> exactly. See, now I'm going to get you. Yeah. Exactly. You want I, that I got organic all organic food. heirloom seeds, man. I gotta, I'm got. i waiting for the spring to fully hit so I can plant my organic garden in my backyard. Trust me, I'm, I'm all about that life. But just no when doubt. it comes to growing cannabis, salt is for me. <laughs> and I personally don't believe, uh, you know, there's going to be lots of arguments about it, but I, I personally don't believe that the plant really knows the difference between organic nutrient molecules or synthetic nutrient molecules. They uptake them the same way. You know? <laughs> you wanted to light the bridge on fire, bro. <laughs> We're going to have a month-long uh, discussion. Oh, I already know. It's a Ford and Chevy. Here we go. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But um, yeah, man. So damn, the Q and A went a lot quicker than we thought. Um, I had um, oh, square root number seven. You didn't talk about that one, did you? Yeah, I got another twenty minutes or so, so we can okay. go for a while. All right. Um, your square root number seven. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Did, did you talk about that one at all? Um, no, I don't think we did. That's actually a pheno that I just hunted from Bee Leaf. Um, so he sent me some tester packs of daily grape times dipping sticks a few months back finally got the square root finally got it into the run when i messaged him i was like hey i got this really good phoenix like oh we named that one square root i was like cool um i like the name a little bit but i decided to call my pheno my high fun dip which i feel is a little bit more in line with what what it the flavor profile is like 
but it's a uh, it's it's very much akin to raspberry and cherry fun dip you know the the candy the little dip the fun yeah. dip candy and um with a little bit of skunk on the back end and i really like enjoy the flavor profile i finally had a little bit of it dry hair i gave some to my friend of mine and he just won't stop asking me for more so that right there is my first clue that i'm onto something good and he said the high was just incredible so he said he didn't really expect um the high to be that good because he said the fruity stuff in his mind doesn't always smoke as good as the gassy stuff and i think that's just a mental thing um again we're going back to what people like you know what they've told themselves is the best in some people's mind the best thing is some great flavored you know artificial grape flavored flower they had and other people's mind the best thing is some skunk number one or some some og kush they had you know and that just sticks once you decide this is the best flavor profile it just stays with you like that mm -hmm. i will say that with be leaf stuff um that his gassy st strains seem to be kind of more hit harder for me um yeah i ran some of the dip and stick stuff and while growing it really was very fruity and some of it just didn't translate into the smoke, you know, but I didn't like wash it or anything like that, but just to, to the flower. Um, he, he, you know, he loves his gas anyway. So he just kind of seems like he's getting on, on board with kind of some of the fruity stuff. <laughs> right. See that question, Dave? The single greatest trade I hunt for in veg, I would be, I would say, uh, I just look for vigor man, like plants that are the most vigorous. That's like, you know, large fan leaves seem to, but I don't look for traits in veg to decide on keepers. That's just not the way, not the way to do it. You can have a plant in veg that looks ugly as hell, man, and it'll flower and just be the most beautiful thing ever. So, um, I don't look for traits and veg in terms of keepers. I just look for strength traits and veg like, oh, this plant is vigorous, like keep an eye on that. But at the end of the day, I don't decide what's good until like the last like week seven, week eight. And even after cure is when I might make the final decision and be like, yeah, this is the one because sometimes flavor profiles can change after 14 days of drying. Well, what are your uh, what are your thoughts to kind of wrap up? What are your thoughts on kind of how the the industry is moving? You know, like from our point of view, from the regenerative side of things, I guess this is more my my view is that Michigan is kind of taking hold. Where Colorado is behind the scenes, California is behind the scenes now. The some of the brighter mind individuals are up there, not only growing but washing and um, right. So, do you feel like in your world, Denver is starting to fall behind as well, or? you think on, on that side of things, we're still kicking it? Um, I think Colorado is still putting out some of the best flower, especially with me here. Um, yeah, that's a, that was a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> uh, no, honestly, honestly, I think Colorado is still putting out some of the best flower I've seen. I, I actually grew up in Southern California. Um, I, I, I wasn't born there. I was born in on the East coast and my family moved to Southern California. I was about a year old. So I pretty much grew up there, you know, during my teenage 20, you know, early twenties. And, um, California was known for having the best flower. Like I used to have friends that would go to Amsterdam and they'd be like, dude, the flower here in Cali is better than Amsterdam. And I moved to Colorado and I honestly thought the flower here when I first moved here 15 years ago was better than, a lot of the stuff that I was seeing in California. Um, I think today the market is so saturated with mid-grade growers that it's hard for people to distinguish where the best herb is coming from. Like at one time, like I said, it was California, but now California is so saturated with low quality flour that no, I don't, not too many. I mean, some people still say Cali got the best wheat. I don't really think that's the truth at all. I think the flower coming out of from some of the best grows here in Colorado is better than anything I see coming out of California. Not to say that there's bad growers in California. There's a lot of guys doing, you know, great things. There's a lot of guys putting out top quality flower out there. Um, there's just a lot more putting out low quality flower out there. 
Yeah, there's a which, lot of meds in the world. Yeah. <laughs> some lot. people don't even know it. They don't even know it. There's a lot of meds, man, from Oklahoma to California, to even to Colorado. There's a lot of I go in dispensaries here all the time because I like to smoke concentrates. So, you know, I go in dispensaries, I'll buy that uh hundred dollar gram of 710 ice water hash and just to get a different flavor profile on my palate. And uh, I always look at the flower and just got to shake my head like, who the fuck is growing this shit? Because it looks terrible. Mm -hmm. Even the trim, man. The people, the trim is a lost art. You know, that is just like nip them and uh, nip them and put put them out there. Like trim is a yeah. big, big deal. Yeah. I hand trim everything. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, I know a lot of people that like to, you know, bag trim or machine trim. I'm 100%. I like to touch everything. Yeah. with my hands you know i just love to hand trim i wanted to ask do you this day and age since you do have your own ability to kind of create instagrams and all that you know, uh -huh. ma magazines aren't necessarily like i was you know, they're a dinosaur in a way but what they represent sometimes is still there so now that you've been recognized by high times do you notice like a bump in sales does that still exist or is that just um, kind of like it, it gives you every time i get a post Every time I get a repost from a larger profile on Instagram, I get a bump in sales. Um, any single, like if I, if I post like the Mahai Dave cut and it gets reposted by like, I, like Athena, they have a hundred plus thousand followers. My inbox gets inundated with, Hey, can I buy that cut? Can I buy that cut out of a hundred people that might message me? I tell them all it's $2,000 a cut, maybe five will bite. And that's okay because I don't want a hundred people to be able to afford the cut. And, and for that reason, um, cause I don't want the market to be oversaturated with it right away. You know, I understand that saturation is a thing that takes time. And if you have a cut, it's only a matter of time before it gets everywhere. And I realize there's guys out there who will buy it for the high price and turn around and resell it for a low price. All That's what things, I was just about to ask you. So do you want to go things, deeper on that? Yeah. All, I, I've had all these things happen. And, um, you know, so, when it comes to that, when somebody says, Hey man, uh, is this cut like your cut? If I, if I can verify that it is, I will, I don't have a problem. Even if you're going to get it for cheaper, I'll go ahead and verify. I'll say, yeah, like I'll, I'll ask them, who'd you get the cut from? If they say, you know, they got it from this person and I can kind of trace the lineage back to me, then okay, cool. Yeah, that's legit. If I can't verify, like one guy mentioned, he's like, Hey man, this looked like your cut. And I was like, uh, who'd you get it from? He's like, Oh, I got it from a guy who hustles. He doesn't like to say who we got. I was like, well, I can't verify that, bro. I can't verify anything coming from a hustler. You know, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't want to tell me who you got it from. It probably ain't real. So, um, you know, I don't get upset at stuff like that. Um, what I explain to people is I do monthly testing for HLVD plus 10 plus viroids and pathogens on all my mother's. Um, I run an ex extremely tight, clean grow. If you get something from me, 100% you're going to get what it is. You might buy something from someone else and they tell you, hey, this is the Mahai Dave cut. And you might be buying some da random Dante's Inferno some dude grew out and decided to call it the Mahai Dave cut. Or you might be buying something infected with a viroid or a pathogen or HLVD. Those are all risks you're taking by saying, hey, I'm going to go somewhere else and get instead of getting it from you. So I've had people, you know, message me with buyer's remorse. Oh, hey, man, is this your? I'm like, dude, I know for a fact you just bought that from a scammer. And they're like, dang, man. I'm like, look, I understand you're trying to save money. But which, again, which brings me back to why I came up with the whole Mahai concept, Mahai club concept is because I, I don't like to see people get ripped off in my using with by somebody using my name. So I think I can curb a lot of that by offering this monthly by monthly subscription you know, a couple hundred dollars for the whole year. You're going to get six of my best cuts throughout the year. Okay. All right, good. Well, I don't think we have any more questions, man. Uh, how are you looking on? We say you got got to go to practice. <laughs> yeah, my son has football practice in about 10 minutes here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, that's what's up, man. Appreciate you dropping everything that you did on us. And um, like I said, man, we're all growers here, so it's good to you know hear you know different perspectives. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I'm still gonna run where run my stuff. Um, you know, you're gonna still run your stuff, and we're gonna yeah keep doing what we do. 
And, um, you know what I mean? And that's just, that's just kind of what makes the community, you know, what it is, man. It's diverse. There's a lot of different ways to do the same thing. And, you know, it absolutely. Is what it is. <laughs> absolutely. There's, there's more than, more than one way to make a gourmet meal. And just because you're using organic ingredients versus, you know, um, some factory ingredients doesn't make, make mean your meal is going to come out any less. Um, uh, well, actually with food, I might argue that organic is better, yes. but, uh, <laughs> you <know it. laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, man. And also Brian, I'll be in uh, Denver this weekend. If you want some samples, dude, I can bring you some, uh, samples of some stuff I just pulled down. Yeah, man, I'll be at Repticon. I don't know if that's any, but yeah, man, if I can uh, link up with you at some point. Okay, um, yeah, definitely. At any time, it'd be cool to, to kind of rock with you, man. I'm, like I had mentioned, you're uh, you're well known. Like there's a, a, a wind, a whisper about you <laughs> in the industry. And it's been like that for, for a few years now. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to uh, build my brand and build my name and, and really just bring the best quality flower that I can find to the masses. That's my ultimate goal. And remember, everybody out there, just you know, if you can't afford that price or it's not for you, he told you his breeders. You can go pick up, get a pack. You can yep. search and take the time and find your own phenos. You don't. Or you can to. wait about a month for the Mile High Club to drop, and you can get six cuts a year at random. You, I guarantee you, I'll be giving out the Mile High Dave cut as well as everything else that's in the top of my genetics library. There you go. I think uh, you know too with. People feel a certain way about politics, right? And then obviously people feel a, almost like another level of, of belief system when you're talking religion. And for some right. people, I think with cannabis, it's almost like they're above that with religion on how they believe and it's, it's cultish. It's, so what I hope from this point on, and Marco is in the same boat, is that we can have discussions. We can have people on the show so it wouldn't be necessarily always one-sided. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that our goal is to change your mind or you're, you know, we're bringing you on so you can change our minds. It's more of if you're growing high end cannabis, you're being recognized by some of the old school, granted the you know, high times kind of lost its luster a little bit, but you know, it still has a, a nostalgia to, to, especially to some people that are newer into this. Uh, right. So to be recognized by that, uh, you're obviously doing something correct. And, you know, to have the, the whisper, like I was saying in the industry, then, um, you're, you're consistently putting stuff out there. Um, and that's, that's what it's about. Even though we might not see eye to eye on, on, you know, the, the getting to the end goal. Um, you know, I, I think at the same time, we can learn a lot from each other and um, Absolutely. hopefully also see that we're not, you know, if we were working more together as a group, as just cannabis individuals, um, there would be a lot bigger voice, and I, I know that's oh, yeah, probably I, never going to happen. But I just—I don't do the—I I don't do the organic versus salt wars. Like I see some of those guys get into that shit, I just laugh and shake my head because, like at the end of the day, like I said, it's—it's it's like Ford and Chevy. Like, dude, we're talking cars here. You like it or not? <laughs> so I feel the same way with cannabis. It's like I don't—I'm not really too big on how you grew it. Um, as long as you weren't using a fuck ton of chemicals and pesticides and like really harsh stuff in your grow, like I'm, you know, I support every grow method on the market. Yeah, right on. And I guarantee people are learning a lot, especially from coming with the cuts and you know, it's more to the consistency, um, you know, the, the hype breeders that kind of come and go and it takes years for you as an individual to probably see that for yourself, unless you got a, a network and realize that you're going to make some mistakes you're going to buy some packs that are going to be duds. Um, yes. The best way I, someone explained it to me is these are lottery tickets, bro. So just be, yes. you know, kind of knowing yes. that you got to put money up that and realize that even in the lottery, right, it's fixed. Um, so a lot of these things are fixed. And if you kind of yes. change that mindset, you're not going to feel the sting as much. In, you know, as I yes, 100%. All right, Marco, you want to uh, shout out anything? And uh, mile, mile high after uh, Marco's speech, we'll kind of give you that last word on if um, you want to hype the, you know, all of the things that you're doing, sir. Thank oh, you. yeah, definitely. Yeah, man, I'm just um, kind of doing doing the same thing. I appreciate everybody that's still um, ordering uh, things off the website. I, I've got all my orders out yesterday. Um, appreciate that support. And more importantly, your garden will love that IMO. Um so, yeah, man, we're just um, kind of doing the same thing. Shout out Gary Gardens, man. I hadn't seen, talked to him in a while. Turp, Turp Farmer, um, VA Grows, another good guy. 
other than that, man, just catch me here. Um, we're thinking about moving the show to Thursday, so you know we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Hey, well, thank you guys for having me on. Um, I appreciate it. I uh, I enjoyed the talk. I think I got some good insight. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't knock anybody's method of growing, whether it be organic or with salts. I think uh, we all have the ability to achieve whatever you want if you put your mind to it in this industry. I think a lot of our audience might also see that, you know, whatever style they, they really want to adopt. Um, there's obviously a bunch of different styles within the, the living soil umbrella, uh, but genetics are a huge part of that. And when I first was getting into this, we thought lighting and all these other things were important, which they are, but not at the same level of when you're trying to especially get that eye, uh, be able to create that eye for pheno hunting so that you don't miss some of those opportunities that might come early, which are lucky. Uh, but you might not have the eye to know and, and chop that down or, or not well, keep the cut and all of that. And, and I think with pheno hunting too, as well, is you have to have the ability to bring any given genetic to its full potential. I think there's a I think there's a world of keepers out there that have been lost to uh, subpar growers. You know, if you don't have the ability to bring a pheno to its ultimate potential, then you're just not going to do that. So then you might grow something out and you don't think it's as good as it really is, um, which is why you'll see a hundred growers grow the same pheno and get a hundred different results. You know, it's because it takes a certain level of skill to bring the maximum potential out of any given phenotype. And, and that's something even I'm working with on with myself daily. I'm constantly trying to improve my skills so I can, bring forth the best from these seeds that i'm popping yeah life's passing you by either way bro right so you might as exactly. well try to find these little uh ways to build up those attributes and i think that's why mark marco and i put in uh you know we do this each and every week man and it's uh we don't get paid we don't it's all for the community i think that as a whole is like when we first came on uh, talking about there's something to the the metaphysical in life and uh, it's pretty sweet to be tapped in. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for the work you're doing with the genetics, man. Keep doing that. Keep putting quality first. And, um, you know, everything will work itself out, bro. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yep. All right. We'll see you guys next week. We got London on the show. London on the track. Uh, a lot of you have been reaching out uh, because he moved his entire family uh, to Italy. Uh, that's a bold move, obviously, and uh, I think a lot of people respect it and want to find out, you know, what his thought process is and where he's going to go. It was just in Spanibus, got a bunch of fantastic interviews, so a lot about uh, a lot to talk to him about uh, next week. Again, Maha Day, appreciate you, man. Even uh, showing that face, dude, the wizard, Mr. Oz. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate Peace. you. Yeah, have a good one.